Hello, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have uh, a presentation called Spiritual Decol Decolonization as Epistemic Emancipation, a Critical Conceptual Analysis by our fellow member of the student uh, committee, uh, the student research committee, uh, Thomas and Singbed. Uh, uh, I'll let Thomas start with the presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, hi, everyone. I'd like to preface um, presentation. It was a very interesting experience, like a very interesting thought, something I've been thinking about. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. So I would like to, I would just, Start over. I would like to start uh, preface my presentation with a very interesting experience. Uh, something I thought about. I listened to why we really started this entire thing about spiritual decolonization as epistemic emancipation, doing a critical conceptual analysis. And when I I listened to music, it was basically um, something that was started uh, around the 1980, I think it was a music that was released in the 98, 98 and 96, somewhere around there, by the Nigerian singer Bella Kuti. And he said something really interesting. The title of the music is Teacher Done Teacher's Nonsense. And, and the essence of, of making that music, as Bella explains, was colonial methodology has become a sort of oppressive machinery. And there's a need to decolonize the African mentality. So he was finding the way for thinkers trying to decolonize the African mind and make the African culture very, very cardinal. It's not any sort of essentialist approach necessarily, but just to mainstream it within the general debate, a form of deconstructing and deterritorializing African epistemology. So let's get started. If you look on the background, um, you see definitely uh, a photo earlier. Let me show you this. In the background is there's a photo of Edward Wilmot Bladen, and and Bladen is is a figure who used the term spiritual decolonization. So definitely, I have just two objectives, and, I, and I'm very positive we can even go beyond that in this course of it. Just to provide a concrete conceptual understanding of spiritual decolonization and to examine it within the general debate of epistemological violence. Africa has been portrayed, Africans generally uh, have been portrayed in different lights in, in Western uh, philosophy, not just in Western philosophy, but just in the general culture and, and the way those of African descent. That's why one of the important things in this presentation is that I'm going to really abandon the term African and use the term Africana political thought because my intent is not just to focus on Africa as a continent, but to deterritorialize it in a way that we incorporate diaspora and political thought. So let's get started. Basically, this is just the outline. I uh, will look at the problematic, the question, and examine key arguments, do the conceptual analysis, refine the concept, conclusion, and references. But let me be very key with this. Conceptual analysis, um, I wouldn't in, in, in many ways be an armchair analytic philosopher trying to examine counter arguments to find generally necessary and sufficient conditions. But what I intend to do in this presentation is to provide you an understanding of what spiritual decolonization is within the context of Africa to provide an extensive 
an intentional definition of what spiritual decolonization is. What is spiritual decolonization? And one disclaimer, this presentation is going to be uh, very controversial because issues that we'll discuss here really raise emotions. It has to do with race and, and, and a lot of different issues. So this is something that probably you might have a different view of and it's something that we can always, always discuss. Secondly, this is no cosmological argument. I'm not talking about decolonial spirituality in terms of demarcating the spiritual or trying to find some sort of Africanism. That's not the case. But essentially, trying to understand how Bladen used the term spiritual decolonization and how it can be applied, how to rightfully apply the term spiritual decolonization. Why should we conceptually clarify? There are many reasons for conceptual clarification. Firstly, uh, like John Stuart Mills would say, the excellence of analysis enabled us to separate ideas that have been casually clung together. Conceptual analysis provides epistemic light on ideas. It helps us to understand how concepts are used within specific contexts and um, how because Terms are not concepts. Just using a term that doesn't have a concept is automatically useless. So we want to understand how a concept is used, in what way it is used, in order to prevent what Abra Kassana would call anachronism of or amagan. That is trying to take something from a specific period, some sort of chronological inconsistency, trying to transpose something that is not from this period into another period. So just to talk a little, and, and I will proceed further with that in, in, in later slides, but let me set the background by discussing who this thinker is that started this entire thing about spiritual decolonization as we know it. The man on your screen is Edward Wilmer Bladen. Edward Wilmer Bladen, just to talk a little about him, is a Liberian thinker. Bladen was born in the 19th century in, in St. Thomas the Virgin Islands. And he went over to the United States for education. He was denied because of his race. Upon funding by the New York Colonization Society, Bladen um, immigrated to Liberia, where he settled and he became one of the foremost thinkers and forebearers of African political thought. So Bladen developed this spiritual decolonization. Bladen developed this spiritual decolonization perspective in. Uh, debate he had with the Anthropological Society of London in 1867. So generally, as I foresteated, uh, questions I'll be looking at will be what does it mean to be spiritually decolonized and how such conceptual understanding shape African epistemology. And there has been this, this debate about whether there is an African epistemology would we'll examine that equally and, and see how it helps in understanding methodological approaches to Africa and, and Africana political thought. A book was published in 1853, and the title of that book was The Inequality of the Human Race. And that was published by the French thinker, Arthur Count de Gouverneur. And he published that book with the argument that races are not equal. And, 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 the, and the thing about it is that he believed that Western races are superior and African or black race is inferior. And generally it comes with, with an intellectual argument that Caucasians or Europeans have especially fantastic and superior intellectual mentality while Africans have very inferior intellectual mentality. Then in 1863, a publication again by James Hahn. James Hahn was a British anthropologist. It started mostly with, with uh, anthropologists who were closely aligned with the social Darwinist tradition in the United Kingdom. And, and mostly after the formation of the British Anthropological Society or the Anthropological Society of London in uh, 1863, there were many arguments about uh, the biological explanation of race. So they believed that uh, the differences between races were more biological and they 
and on an old condition, the African race can be equated, or the black race generally can be equated to um, to that of the European or the white race because they are totally different. They were gifted by the supreme being with different qualities. The black race necessarily will be servants of the white race. That was generally the understanding. The rest of it. So in a conversation with that, after all of these uh, theses were being published by the Anthropological Society of London, Bladen then responded in 1867. This title is entitled to be the spiritual decolonization. And Bladen responded using the same racialist thesis of the Anthropological Society of London. One interesting thing about Bladen, like uh, Tishari Tabibu will say, Bladen was a mere of incurable contradictions. And uh, Modemi will say Bladen was a man that was full of anti racist racism. I don't necessarily agree with that, but for the sake of the uh, for the sake of the argument, we, we try to factor in that. Bladen, in responding to the racial thesis of the Anthropological Society, argue that there's an inherent difference between the white race and the black race. So Bladen, using more of a Manichaean approach where he deceived between what is good and what is bad, trying to find binary categories in order to develop this concept of spiritual decolonization. So Bladen, like Augustine, developing the idea of, of the earthly city and the heavenly city, using an Augustinian approach in a certain way, or probably adopting a Hegelian approach of, of, of the dialectics, the master slave dialectics, and the idea of recognition, the dialectic paradigm of recognition, where there are two self-consciousness, and one is trying to negate and objectify the other in order to gain some sort of recognition, and there's this based on recognition. Or probably Vladimir was getting in, in an Iranian common world and dealing with the interaction of the political community where there can be equality. So there are many ways to see Vladimir, there are many ways to think about Vladimir, but Vladimir developed this binary category where he tried to differentiate between what a white race is and what a black race is. So Vladimir's basic argument was that the white race was characterized by naturalness and the black race by spirituality. So he called the white necessary uh, those arguments of superiority of the white. And he thought that, oh, okay, since racialism is used as, as a basis for uh, differentiating or distinguishing races or classifying races, I can adopt that same position in order uh, to destroy the argument and, and, and present the fact that blacks are not inferior to whites, but they are equal. The only difference between them is opportunity and political supremacy does not mean human supremacy. So when he developed this, this a categorization of naturalness and spirituality, Bladen then argued that the white race or the white man is characterized by naturalness or humanness and his trait essentially is that a brutality and encroachment and unfair competition and, and the strategy generally, whereas the African is characterized by spirituality, spontaneity and goodwill. So the Africans, the African generally for blood and, and, and the black race generally for blood and was one of uh, seven who was one of humidity, was one of love, was one of passion, was one of gentleness, something, these are enviable virtues. Whereas for the Western race, he saw that more of been uh, characterized by some sort of evil tendency. So this is the human part of a man and, and next is the spiritual part of the man. So with the construction of what a spiritual being looks like, uh, Bladen tried to think of Africans in another life, not more like uh, Senghor would put it in the form of uh, more emotional beings to a large extent, but Africans had qualities that were totally different from the West. So in an attempt to counter Western universalism, he believed that we must separate their personalities because it is the personality of the white race that empower them to conquer and to enslave and to brutalize and, and to dominate and even in the new imperialist age 
to exploit the African race or to exploit other races. Whereas for the black man, it is just to love and to have communion. That's why Bladen in his African life and custom work appeal to the African society generally by saying we have a communal and a loving system where one may care for one another. And that is not the case with the extreme individualism and brutality of the white race. So that was just the binary, that was the first binary category that uh, Bladen then developed. Bladen went further by arguing that racialism or, or the idea that the white man, God gave him the natural way to flog the Negro is in itself uh, very cynical and totally unacceptable. There's no way the white can claim that they are better than, than the blacks. And there, there should be some sort of division between what is white and what is black because whites and blacks can never ever have the same qualities. And the African generally being a spiritual being is holistically spiritual. So Blatter in a certain sense does not agree with, with uh, René Descartes' Cartesian dualism that the mind and the body are separate entities and the mind operate differently from the body. The mind is this, also the body. Blatter believes that the mind and body are the same and, and Africans throughout exemplify qualities of being spiritual beings, even in times of enslavement. And he used everything, blood and said, no nation or race has a monopoly of the channels which lead to the sources of divine grace or spiritual knowledge. He uses the term spiritual, yet the slavery of the mind is far more destructive than that of the body. So he establishes a platform through which we can understand decolonization, that is, removing emasculating Western universalism and providing an alternative perspective where two races can be able to converse over issues. But usually Bladen is criticized particularly for this because for, for most African political theorists, Bladen is using the same racial methodology of, of uh, white philosophers in order to, and, and, and white thinkers in order to counter them. But Bladen thought necessary that the best way you can counter them is to differentiate between what a white race is and what a black race is. So in addition to that, a black and white understand the great point at which you should aim is not simply the information that is in his own uh, exposition of what decolonization is. It's not simply the information, but the formation of the mind. According to Bladen, the information takes care of itself when the mind takes care of itself. The mere knowledge of itself is not power, but the ability to know how to use that knowledge. And this ability belongs only to the mind. There, there is an essential problem here, yeah, and, and this necessity conceptual clarity. This is why we need to conceptually clarify this, because blood and use of multiple consciousness and definition, yet yeah, taking the mind. When, when blood and talks of the mind, what is he referring to? I mean, there's this tendency for, for most African thinkers, as we've seen through the canon, to just consider the one dimensionally. Oh, mind decolonization means this, mind decolonization means that. But I basically think, and in, in a lot of ways, blood in, in referring to the mind did not specifically focus on just the mind as an entity. Blood in focus on the entire being, and that is the throughout the African and, and whenever. Uh, the, the entire psychology of the African, and it's a reminder, even the body and, and physical interactions and whatever that the, the, the African can think of. So it is, it is bodily and, and uh, decolonization, decolonization of activities of the African, not generally just what the mind is. And there's even this, this vague idea of what the mind stands for. So what, what, what I do believe is that it's important to consider this entire concept of spiritual decolonization rather one dimensionally, but as a multi layer concept. When you see in the literature, spiritual decolonization has been used in a lot of different ways. Kosi Waridu, Ashirum Bembi, Marco Giegi, Ali Masri, Wilfred Laju, and the rest of them using the term of conceptual decolonization. One way, concept of decolonization is, is looking at African philosophy generally and African thought patterns and ensuring that you philosophize within African languages because for them 
spiritual decolonization could mean not using the epistemological quantum of Western hermeneutics, but rather going back to African languages and understanding context of Africa within the African linguistic context will help in spiritual decolonization. For Ngogi Wapiongo, Karaus, and others, they focus more on the later interpretation of spiritual decolonization by thinking that, oh, um, if you liberate the mind, then generally um, you can do anything. So there's this very narrow idea of what the mind seems to be with, with, within uh, mind decolonization, very big to a very large extent. Cultural decolonization, I mean, Cize, Kuti, Sembili, Usmani, and the rest of them. Senghor, for example, using the agriculture, the fact that African culture must be decolonized to an extent where Africans themselves and, and, and uh, those of African descent, diasporans, must believe and, and must elevate the African culture, must not imbibe what the West says. One form of decolonization is that in terms of dressing and languages and whatever must not be dictated necessarily by uh, what the West aims as fashion, for example. You, you read a book or probably watch a movie and whatever that is contrary to Western explanation or whatever that goes contrary to Western values is considered uh, probably inferior, is, is, is considered exotic, is considered very uninteresting because it's not Western. And, and this idea that everything that must be properly cultural must come from the West. This is something that Africans don't necessarily agree with. They believe that if the African mind is just uh, generally filled with exactly what Western interpretation for cultural activities are, then African themselves will not be African. So these are just different ways in the literature in which we've seen spiritual decolonization. And then, for example, looking at Nkrumah's philosophical consciousness, posing another way through which we can um, look at spiritual decolonization from a conceptual perspective. How, sh how should we make sense of spiritual decolonization? What is spiritual decolonization? How does a spiritually decolonized mind works? So drawing from Bladen's work that developed like a full part category and looking at spiritual decolonization. Like I, like I full said it, not just in a one dimensional way, but just looking at it as, uh, the same concept, but having uh, different specificities. The first one is self-awareness. A spiritual decolonized mind is, is one that is self-aware, like Gladden, who obviously, and say through his work, an African should be confident of their own humanity, that I am a human equated to that of any man that walk across the globe. There should be a sense of Afrocentric historical consciousness. She can't idea of a reading about it. The Africans themselves should be proud of that proud of who they are, that the history written for Africa is not African history. It's a form of what Gayatri's people would call it systemic violence, that the West has created a narrative. For example, when you take like um, maybe some sort of drawing, you see an African picture like a monkey somewhere lying in a tree or this sort of intellectual inferior being trying to make sense of something, or an African uh, a man or is dying, whatever century trying to craft for bread or this. You you find a lot of different explanations for and a lot of different ways Africans have been portrayed in literature. But what and even this idea about Africa being underdeveloped and, and generally poor continent necessarily. What Bladen thought is that all of these narratives were created as as a result of uh, what the West want African to believe. And, and bloody major argument was the fact that the West, through their epistemological violence, created mimic African and paradigm African in, in, uh, on the external end, on the external level, excuse me, and at the same time implanted within African a form of um, inferiority complex. And that inferiority complex play a role. And it's very essential that if Africans develop an Afrocentral historical consciousness, they can be able to combat that sort of implanted inferiority complex of uh, Western 
knowledge of Western epistemological sources. So when she under the uh, root of the fact of the brilliant Egyptian civilization and the fact that Africans have excelled and throughout the ages and, and Africa, the African, the black race have never been a backward race. They've always contributed to civilization. One of the key arguments from, from uh, Western races, the fact that Africa, or the African race or the black race has never contributed in any way to human civilization. That is contrary to fact. And Afrocentric historical consciousness and African endeavor for that will help give them an edge um, in decoding in the process of decolonization that I have to do away with the narrative that I do not belong to this category and I've not contributed anything. African must be made aware, must be confident that they have contributed a lot to human civilization, cultural reanimation. There must be a turn. The African should develop passion, enthusiasm, and love for their culture and psychological reorientation. These are things speaks literally to the form of mind decolonization. Just changing the African psychology, the psychology that has been really messed up by Western epistemology. So basically just to sketch this up, we see uh, a spiritual decolonization as emerging from African epistemology. And that is Africa does have a way of thinking about things, their context in which Africans uh, look at things. They are basic knowledge sources of Africa. And this general understanding that whatever the African know as history or whatever the African consider has been narrated to them by the way, that is extremely wrong. Because sage wisdom and other sources, Africans have knowledge sources just as any other, uh, um, any other race, the black race has knowledge sources like any other race through cognition and reason, the blood have come to understand and to know, to have justified true belief about things. So things can be considered from an African context. And there's this general debate that what is even an African context? Because we, even what is African is socially constructed, was constructed by the West. This is something we disagree on because developing an African historical consciousness takes you back to prehistoric Africa, it takes it back to the wonder movement of Africa, you can definitely understand that there is a specific and, and there are specific ways of, of being and thinking as an African. And generally looking at the different divisions of, of, of uh, what is cultural decolonization, mind decolonization, or eventually uh, that of conceptual decolonization, these are just different categories of spiritual decolonization. These are just different frames of spiritual decolonization. And one cannot be taken separately and, and, and taken in a specific dimension and thinking about it that, okay, but this is the only way we can be spiritually decolonized. No, absolutely. You cannot only be spiritually decolonized by culture. I think thinking about it that direction would be extremely problematic for the concept of spiritual decolonization. And, Spiritual decolonization must result to an emancipation of the entirety of the African personality, not just the psychology, not just the mind, but in all of the African endeavor, there must be this form of awareness, self-awareness, African historical consciousness, and there, there must be this, this interest in cultural reanimation and psychological reorientation. But these are necessary conditions. These are necessary conditions for spiritual decolonization, but are they sufficient conditions? This is something that we can probably discuss. Um, and then basically just to conclude on this, spiritual decolonization emphasizes the spirituality of the African personhood and character, and it helps in challenging epistemic violence. What is epistemic violence? Narratives, a colonized narratives about Africa, whenever we take spiritual decolonization as bad and important as we understand as a form of self-awareness, as uh, cultural reanimation, African historical consciousness, and taking the condition of, of psychological reorientation, cultural reanimation, definitely all of these joined together, these necessary conditions joined together can provide a strong urge and, and a strong instrument, a strong tool in countering epistemic violence. And as long as um, there exists 
philosophy or idea or thought or even practical engagement as we see in different movements, there will always be this argument about who constructs your reality. Thanks for listening. All righty, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I would like to open now the floor to a, any questions that uh, any of you guys might have. Uh, if, if so, uh, if, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, show, show your, your face too. Go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Um, I am calling from Nigeria. You are muted, like, um, mute yourself. Yemi, you are muted. Uh, oh, yes, yes, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sure, this works. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go. Yeah, thank you. I said um, it's um, a great privilege to be part of this lecture, and it has it's it's it's, it's good to be here. So basically, my question about um, this spiritual decolonization and the bleedings um, regarding the bleedings, the political and thoughts and philosophy is that um, you know, as African, you know, speaking as an African and residing in African continent as an African. Things are um, things are actually uh, more realistic here than the way it is being usually discussed in academic and intellectual discussions. So you know when we're talking about um, spiritual decolonization or decolonization of any form of, of the African personality and persons. Before we can talk about um, decolonization, there must be a uh, I don't know how to really put this, but before we can, you know, decolonization is more or less the kind of freedom. The kind of liberty. So before you can um, strive to attain that in full in full fledged, you know there must be some certain factors that must uh, that must have been put in place. You know, for instance, I'm talking about decolonization. I want to decolonize from the Western uh, thoughts or you know mindset that has been imprinted in African minds and persons. We must um, take of the maybe the education sector for instance so let's assume now that we have we are we are aiming towards the colonization of the of african persons from the western world or from the western political thoughts you know most of uh, our education are patterned along this line most of our, our way of life that past their pattern even cultural even religious re religiously so how do we balance this thing how do we how do we balance it's that is actually what I want to. And that's that's a very fantastic question. And thank you, thank you for that. I if, if you look at uh what are displayed with, with the mortal layer concept, that, especially the, the mortal Mobile. layer structure, the mortal layer structure of understanding what blood is meant by spiritual decolonization, you see something about conceptual decolonization. So blood and speaking of decolonizing African person who does not want to limit itself and, and if you view blood and whether Christian Islam and the Negro view, blood and focuses more on education as, as a way of decolonization. And that is part of that could be a process of psychological reorientation. This is what uh, other theories, for example, have called conceptual decolonization. That will help to a very long extent. Why do we teach the kids in school and why people learn in school? What have been adapted in the curriculum? Are they portraying? Because exactly one of the interesting things that Bladen said was the fact that 
when you read Western books or whatever's educational material produced by the West, what they've done is that they have allowed Africans to glorify the West and just humiliate themselves. That is the pattern. That is that's the pattern of Western education to a very large extent to see the African for the African man to see himself as inferior and to see the West as superior. So one one way of dealing with that is to ensure that uh, you develop this this pattern in, in African schools where they are taught about Africa. That is, they, they are made to reclaim that African historical consciousness. So that could be a way of spiritual decolonization. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes. Um... Thank you. Yeah, I think you are able to answer it, but uh, I would still like I would still like more enlightenment. Okay, let me give a practical examples. You know, like you said that Blini's major um, um, way of spirituality decolonizing Africa is through education. Of course, I agree. But okay, I want to give an example of um, the uh, the Julius Yeri of Tanzania. You know, he, he formulated the political thoughts known as the Ujama Republic. And in the Ujamaa Republic, according to Julius Nyeri of Tanzania, it is that um, the culture and the way of life of Africans must be domesticated. You know, we've seen instances, we've, st we've seen situations like that of China. And that in China, most of um, Chinese education, most of their subjects, most of their school curriculums have been domesticated to Chinese language and other domestic languages. So, you know, now, so it is very easy for a country like China or for a country like China to actually um, to fully detached and decolonized from maybe Western or every other foreign uh, way of life or uh, I don't know the kind of issue. I, I think you are getting, you, you, you get me. So, but coming to Africa, you know, in Africa, Africa continent comp comprised of almost 54 countries. And out of these 54 countries, none of these 54 countries has an official language which is and indigenous African languages. All of them must either have an official language, either English, the Anglophone countries, the Francophone countries, or Portuguese or Belgian language, you know, before maybe if at all any of them is having other um, um, domestic language, that would be second. That would be second to official language. You know, all these things. So the way I'm seeing it, even in our education, even Africans, practically in our contemporary society these days, Africans, they are more comfortable in um, getting education in Western countries, in other continents, aside from Africa. Most of our school curriculum, okay, for instance, I am a student of politics, and I can categorically say that from my year one to my current year now, I can say that we have been studying Western political philosophers. We study little of Africans. So I'm seeing it as it is not actually achievable that African continents can actually detach, can fully detach from westernized you know, way of life, colonization. And as part of this too, you can see the new form of colonization, the neoliberalism, you know, all of these are under way of colonization. So the question is, is it realistic? Is, is, it, is it realistic that African continent can fully be detached from Western colonization? And then, and here, yeah, now, you may know we are I'm just providing a conceptual clarity of balance concept of, of uh, spiritual decolonization. I'm in no way arguing epistemological particularism. I'm in no way arguing. Uh, ethnic metaphases restricting African experience to, to just Africa doesn't Afri Africans generally uh, whether at home or in the diaspora do not live in isolation they live uh, in communication with the global environment so what I'm saying necessarily is this it is to a large extent achievable uh, is this possible to achieve spiritual decolonization when of to even aim for spiritual decolonization when we look at spiritual decolonization from the way uh, Bladen exposed it. I, I particularly think that this is just a conceptual battle because a lot has been done in terms of impugning the African image in, in terms of creating a mentality within Africans and until we can mind decolonize until Africans become self-aware, until Africans are made to 
to become more historically conscious until Africans uh, to be culturally reanimated and to think about it until they are psychologically reoriented. And the problem here is not just to see all of these different categorizations as just some free floating concept, but there are different processes through which you can achieve cultural reanimation. And one of the things is, this is just uh, one of the central problems in conceptual analysis. Principles are different from criteria of application. You can have all of these as, as, oh yeah, these are necessary conditions for achieving spiritual decolonization. These are pointers to know that someone is spiritually decolonized, but how do we achieve them? Having all of these and, and thinking about all of these, there are measures and there are ways you can, you can approach them. It, it's not just restricted to African political thought. I think it applies to Latin American political thought. It applies to Asian political thought. The approaches, the practical approaches to achieving them has been really, really difficult because the extent of damage epistemological violence has been so, so terrible. Slavery, for example, um, and, and, and even in the literature, the music and, and the prevalence of, of Western culture, Western interpretation, Western narrative have created a new sense of created within Africans themselves or distrust of their culture or have created among people of other cultures or distrust of their own culture and appreciation of Western culture. So until we can aim towards doing that, we can never realize what a truly spiritually decolonized uh, people look like. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think um, uh, I, I really appreciate and I enjoy the line where the expert where you said most of these are they, are they are principles, they are imprinted on papers, but the question is how do we achieve them? Yes, I think that is a very big question that um, students of politics, of political thinking, critical thinkers should ruminate on on how to achieve in this. So I I I I, I think. You've been able to answer my question to some extent. To some extent. Yeah, I, I, I will not be able to answer. What I can tell you is this. Um, what I can tell you very quickly before you come here, I'm sorry to interrupt you. What I can tell you is this. Look at most of the intellectual productions of African philosophy, African thought. Where have they been published? Where were they printed? In the West, of course. Most of their yeah. publishers are Western publishers. Most of the intellectual productions of Africa are done, whether it's in Paris or in Brussels or in Washington or uh, somewhere else. So you, you, you find African narratives that have been told in a certain way. They have been concocted in ways. African knowledge have, to a very large extent, has not been produced where it should be produced. That, mm. that is another constraint about the intellectual productions of Africa. They can possibly to produce your own knowledge. Even, uh, for example, the issue of Bantu philosophy, people refer to Placid Tempo as leading the way for African epistemology, or Belgian thinker going by and saying the Bantu in Central Africa coming about and say, oh yeah, these people have a specific philosophy. Creating a narrative in, 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 in a lot of ways, even when you look at the philosophical kind of most of those we hear today as so-called Western philosophers, whether it's the Kant or the Hegel, or these were all races, as we obviously know them. But I think what Africans, can do for themselves. And I feel it's very important when we, share, when we uh, put a systemic light on this is that if we look at the process of spiritual decolonization, we must not think it through just from a single perspective. Let us look at spiritual decolonization as generally uh, that of the entire African person, who the entire being of African that encompasses all of African, what is the activities or their thinking and necessary and not just focus on a specific person. It's one thing to set a principle and say, okay, self-awareness is one way of achieving spiritual decolonization, but how do we become self-aware? Uh, African historical consciousness, developing African historical consciousness is one way of achieving spiritual decolonization. How do we ensure, and how can we claim that someone has been sufficiently conscious of African history? So these are all important questions that come into play when, 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 whenever you raise the issue of spiritual decolonization. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm really, I'm really impressed. You know, we've been able to <laughs> dissect issues um, the way I expected. Thank you very much. But I would just like to add that you know it's very unfortunate that even most of our schools, our education system. In Africa, we do not even study our scholars. We don't study our political thinkers and philosophers. I can actually, I can say that 
if not for this lecture, I wouldn't have been aware of um, Bladen's political thoughts. And you know, from your from 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 the intro, you you established the fact that he was one of the foremost political thinkers in the African continent. So I think this is an avenue for me to conduct my research more on this subject and this topic and on Bladen's uh, political thoughts. So, I really appreciate this uh, opportunity and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. One reference I can make to you, I feel, and I was not able to cover in this presentation is that from, from Bladen's concept of spiritual decolonization, something that became a slogan, uh, comes this entire African personality theory. This is something you can explore. Um, and this is that because of, of the time limit, I, uh, I could not cover the African personality theory. This is something that we will discuss in subsequent presentation. What is the African personality theory? Generally, I, I feel that it's time not just to just restrict it to African political thought, but just think of it more in the light of, of other uh, epistemologies, what is Asian epistemologies or, or Latin American epistemologies, and see how that apply, how self-awareness applies, how uh, consciousness, historical consciousness apply, how cultural reanimation apply and how psychological reorientation applied and how you can use this multi layer concept in successfully decolonizing uh, people from a specific category or whatever it is. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I work on that. All righty. Um, do do we have any more uh, any more questions or in, any more comments? Okay. Um, well, if uh, if if nothing else, uh, I would like to thank uh, Thomas again for this wonderful presentation. Uh, and yeah, thank you all for giving a little bit of your time today and attending this session. Uh, Thomas, would you like to give any last words? Uh, lastly, uh, I, I, I know definitely the issue of uh, race or the, the, the issue of developing a spiritually decolonized mentality could be a really confusing one, but I feel it's very essential today because if we think think about a lot of different movements that are going across the world for equality and justice and whatever, particularly I like to refer to the case of diaspora and or uh, what is African Americans, Afro Caribbean, Afro British, or whatever the case may be. Spiritual decolonization. It's extremely important because if we want to build an equal world, uh, we need to tackle this, this thing of uh, Western universalism. You cannot interpret another culture or another part of the world from the perspective of just the West. You must, in order to achieve that, uh, we need people to tell their own story. We need people to understand what it means to have a decolonized mind, what it means to be mentally liberated, what it means to be bodily liberated. I think that extends also to those who are considering ideas of decolonial feminism or using decolonialism in other perspectives. It still applies. Self-awareness, cultural reanimation, psychological reorientation, and the rest of it. I'd like to, to close with a quote from Carter Wilson. Scott Wilson, an American historian, he graduated, one of the first black men to graduate from Harvard University. He said, if you control the way of man things, you don't have to worry about his actions. Thank you for listening. Thank you for. All righty. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>